Well, good morning, Gateway. Hope everybody is doing well on this beautiful Sunday morning. It is Sunday, April the 14th in the year of our Lord 2024, the third Sunday in the season of Easter, and the Lord has given us a beautiful day to come together and worship Him here in Pikeville, North Carolina. Welcome to Gateway. My name is Thayer Stamper. It's my privilege to be the pastor here at Gateway, and I especially want to thank you for choosing to worship with us today. If today is your first time or if you've never done this before in the row in front of you, and find a pocket on the back of the chair. You can take just a few minutes, just as a personal favor to me, complete the info on that card and then take it by the guest services counter on your way out. We got something special we want to give you as our way of saying thank you for being our guest. That's the analog way to do it. But if you're into the digital world, you can also take your phone and scan the QR code on the screen behind me. You can open up the Church Center app and that'll let you know how it is that uh, you can do so by your phone. Uh, you can just set Gateway as the church that you're at this morning and say, I'm I'm new to Gateway. It'll let us know that you are here, but it just gives us a record that you were worshiping with us on this beautiful day, and we'd love to be able to have that with you guys. Now, we think about coming together, and uh, we're here today because we believe that our God did something for us that we could never do on our own. It's impossible for us to do on our own, and because of what he has done for us, we have new life. We have hope. We have a future. And we're here to celebrate that this morning, and we're not just winging this thing. We're not just saying that we have it because we want to have it. We're saying it because we believe we have it in the Scriptures, what God has given to us in the Bible as a promise to us. And we pepper our services with Scripture all throughout. We're grateful for God's Word, and we're going to draw attention to it this morning. We're thankful to be able to open our service today by reading together from God's Word. So I'm going to ask you where you are. Let's all stand together. We're going to read from the 17th. Psalm this morning as our call to worship from verses 6 and 7. So let's read together. Let's remain standing for prayer afterward. The scriptures read like this. I call upon you for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me. Hear my words. Wondrously show your steadfast love, O Savior of those who seek refuge from their adversaries at your right hand. Let's pray together. Father, we're grateful that your right hand is mighty, that it is strong, and that it is able and willing to save. And God, to be today, because of the salvation that you offer us by your love and your power, we gather here in this place. We're not trying to earn your love. We're not trying to somehow merit it or show ourselves to be worthy of it. But God, we're here because of what Jesus has done for us because he was good in our place because when he died as our substitute on the cross at Calvary God he took all of our sin upon himself and gave us his righteousness you're mighty to save you're mighty to save God and Jesus is that Savior in which you save us father we come in his name as those who have received his salvation because of what he has done We come today, God, bearing his righteousness. That's what gives us our standing before you. And God, we come with gratitude within our hearts. We're not here to manipulate you. We're not here to convince you to do things for us, God. We're here to say that because we are your people and because we are loved by you, that God, you do what is in our best interest anyway as you glorify yourself. And God, today, with gratitude in our hearts and with thanksgiving, God, not only for what you've done in our past, but for what you do in the present and for what you're going to do in the future. God, we trust you completely. So with gratitude in our hearts, we lift our songs to you. We give to you. We give you our attention. And Father, we pray that Jesus would indeed be glorified as we worship him today. We pray all of these things in his name and for his sake. And all God's people together said, amen. All right, let's worship him today. Good morning, everyone. Let's sing together about Christ, who is our hope and all of life, and even through death, we can cling to that one hope, our Lord. What is our hope in life and death? 
Christ alone, Christ alone, what is our only confidence that our souls to Him belong, who holds our days within His hand, what comes apart from His command, and what will to the end, the love of Christ in which we stand.
our glory in the evening, the cold and dark of night. And glory in the cold and dark of night. The sea. Christ, our glory in the save us, to redeem us. i 
Church, I ask you from this catechism, which is just simply a question and answer teaching us what the Bible ultimately teaches is truth. What is faith in Jesus Christ? Would you read with me? Faith in Jesus Christ is acknowledging the truth of everything that God has revealed in his word, trusting in him and also receiving and resting on him alone for salvation as he is offered to us in the gospel. Notice there it says, he is offered to us in the gospel. This is our Jesus. Would you pray with me as God, that God will bless the word as it's preached to us this morning. This morning we come to you as needy people, admitting God that we are often forgetful, we are sinful, we neglect to be faithful, and yet, Lord, you are constant, you are faithful. We pray, God, that you would teach us through your word and encourage us and build us up, reminding us, restoring us, reviving us, God. Thank you for the message this morning and, Lord, how rich it is in your gospel. Help us, God, to be captured by this truth that every heart would look to Jesus this morning. Lord, we confess that we, though we are forgetful, though we are sinful, we confess that you, our Savior, you went to the cross once for all time. You went and it is done and it is finished. Lord, would you give us a great, deep spiritual, but also a very conscious assurance. We are really saved if we are in you. We are truly forgiven if we are in you. We're truly cleansed from all unrighteousness. 
all of our past, all of our mistakes, and everything in the future is only determined by what you did at the cross, not based on what we have done. May we rejoice in this truth, God, with happy-filled, joy-filled hearts. We pray, Lord, now as your word is opened and taught to us, Lord, that we're, we're transfixed on Jesus, we're focused on Jesus, but Lord, we're, we're changed. We leave differently than we came. We're not just going through the motions, we're not just hurrying up, but we're, we really want to be a changed people. Help us to be serious about this and to receive your word as truth. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Father. We love you, Holy Spirit, the triune God. Be glorified. And we pray this in Jesus' name and for your sake to be worthy of all things. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you. and let's open them up to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. This is week three for us in this particular message series as we talk about the resurrection from the dead and the centrality of what that means to our gospel message. How many movie people would you have in the house today? Anybody like movies? All right. How many of you like going to the movie theater? Right, have to mortgage the house to go these days, right? Depending on how many people you're taking with you, especially if you want a bucket of popcorn, right? All right, how many of you enjoy movies at the house? All right, I enjoy movies at the house. How many of you would say that Netflix changed your life? All right, for the good, uh, maybe not for the good, but but at least it, you can say that there's there's change that is there. Uh, you know, think about movies and think about movies that are done well. Uh, pivotal movies that you might remember from your particular generation. For me, uh, I was 13 years old, or about to turn 13 years old, when Back to the Future came out in 1985. And of course, that's a, a familiar movie to, to so many of us, but you think about that. Uh, think about that movie and think about where it sits uh, in, in your particular life. Of course, I was about 12, 13 years old there, and going back in time, 30 years, okay, into 1955, of course, the story goes as Marty McFly is, is placed in a predicament where he is wondering how it is that, that he can truly exist if his parents don't ever come together and if, if, if uh, Doc Brown ultimately ends up dying by, by the terrorists, how is it that all of these things go? So he, he ends up going back in time 30 years through a magical DeLorean, okay, uh, with, a, with a flux capacitor, and uh, he is able, he is able to bring his parents back together and therefore, and therefore bring himself into existence. But the whole premise of it is, is what if? What if this didn't happen? What if that didn't happen? What if this particular decision didn't get made in this particular way? What would the future look like? And, you know, you guys can do that as well. You know, you can do that in your own life. You think about, what if I had made this decision? What if I had made that decision instead, right? What if I had gone to school here? What if I had pursued this particular interest? What if, what if, what if? And sometimes, you know, those things can be counterproductive because a lot of times the future that we imagine for ourselves based on what if tends to be better, all right, than what we are right now and we can end up living our lives in regret. Sometimes we can say what if and we can say, well, you know, the Lord might have saved me from a particular kind of decision there. But playing the what if game can be pretty, can be pretty difficult and be pretty, pretty taxing upon you. But people not only do that uh, in their personal lives, but think about just like on a national or international scale. Do you know that there's an entire genre of literature that's called alt 
history. Anybody ever heard of alt history? Now, if you've ever seen the, the, the net, no, not Netflix, but the Amazon Prime series, The Man in the High Castle, okay? The Man in the High Castle is based on a reality or on the premise, let's just say, not the reality, that the U.S. and the Allies lost the Second World War. All right, and that America is a divided country. The Japanese control the West Coast, and the, the Germans control the East Coast. And what would life ultimately look like in this particular era had that come true? Okay, so you got what if, but you not only have that, but you also have others that, that, that have been written over the years. The Clash of the Two Eagles, or the Clash of the Eagles, by a man named Alan Smale. All right, he imagines a time. All right, and, and some of you, this is, a, this is, if you're on social media today, you've probably seen memes or other things like that said about the Roman Empire, okay? Imagine that the Roman Empire has never fallen. Imagine that it never has. And in the year 1278, the Romans actually discovered America, all right? They were coming from the east, and they sailed across the Atlantic and found America. But at the same time, the Mongols discovered it from the West, and they're coming through, and you end up with this clash of civilizations in the New World between the Romans and the Mongols. Now, that's a pretty far-fetched kind of premise, right? But think about decisions that were made on the national scale. Think about this. The big jubilee, right? The big jubilee, based on the premise, that story, based upon the premise, or let's just say the hypothesis, that the South won the Battle of Gettysburg and ended up occupying Philadelphia, and that peace was pursued based upon that premise. What would our future look like had things changed just a little bit, all right? Had decisions not been made, or had decisions been made? Folks, what if, what if, what if, the personal level, and think about the national level, international level. But you know, the interesting thing is, is that Paul himself, he's not in alt history, but he goes into speculative alt history, okay? Speculative alt history when it talks about the resurrection from the dead. The resurrection from the dead. And in verses 12 through 19 of this chapter, this is, as I said, week three for us in this series. We did a, kind of the broad overview on Easter Sunday. We talked about the importance of the resurrection to the gospel message there, verses 1 through 11 last week. But let's talk about what if and the implications, okay? Had particular things not happened, where would we find ourselves today? And Paul going through this, Paul going through this, asks that question over and over and over. And you're going to see it as we put it up there on the screen, and you can also see it in your scriptures this way. The, the question, what if, or but if, or and if, shows up in this particular passage, verses 12 through 19, over and over and over. All right? What if, what if? And remember, the Corinthians are struggling. They're struggling in so many areas, and one of their struggles is with this doctrine and the part of the gospel that Paul says is absolutely central to it, that Jesus has been raised from the dead. Jesus has been raised from the dead, and not only has Jesus been raised from the dead, but because he has been raised from the dead, you're going to be raised from the dead. Now, this church is struggling trying to figure all of this out, but remember that, you know, talking about salvation, and I think that sometimes we as Christians just, just we, we, we miss the point of salvation is that salvation is not just something that God offers to you and me individually. Salvation is something that God is doing in creation to make everything new. When we sing that song, occasionally as we sing it, he is, all right? We're talking about God, what he's doing in the gospel. One of the lines in that song is a new creation coming, okay? What's the response? It is, it is that God is making all things new, that Jesus, as, the, as Paul would say in another book that he wrote there in the New Testament, Jesus, the first fruits from the dead, he is the very first, he's the prototype for everything that is to come, and a new creation is coming, and that you and I, if we are in him, that you and I will live together in this new creation. Now, it's not just a spiritual creation. This is a physical creation that's going to be perfect. And it's a part of the gospel message that, yes, that by believing and by trusting in Jesus, not only do I have hope for my soul now, even though my physical body is going to perish, but one day what is true of my soul and what is true of my spirit, what is true of my heart is going to be realized in the physical world when God makes everything new. 
The resurrection isn't just about Jesus saving your soul. It's about him ultimately giving you real and meaningful and everlasting life, okay? Physical life. It's a part of the gospel. Paul makes that argument. But he says this, you know what? If you're not going to buy into this, then you're really not accepting the gospel. If you're not going to buy into the resurrection, then you're missing the point. And the church there at Corinth was missing the point. And I think a lot of Christians today miss the point. So Paul gives us this what-if scenario over and over and over for us to think through the implications of what it means to truly be changed by the gospel. So looking at verses 12 through 19 today, the scriptures I'm going to read, we're going to put them up there on the screen. You follow along in your Bibles as well. But the scriptures read like this. It says, now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection from the dead? But if there is no resurrection from the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished, if in Christ we have hope in this life only. We are of all people most to be pitied. Okay? How many words or how many times do you see the word if over and over and over? In fact, Paul frames the question there at the beginning as an if. I mean, Paul loves to do this. Paul loves to throw out a question and then answer it. He wants you to think through the implications about what it means to truly be in Jesus, what it means to truly be changed by the gospel. You know, if Christ hasn't been raised from the dead, why is it? Why is it that you can even call yourself Christians? How is it that you can say you've been changed? How is it that you can say you're a part of the church? Because how is it that this even goes together? How is it that any of you can say, if you're truly a part of the church, that Christ hasn't been raised from the dead? You've misunderstood the gospel, and you see this word over and over in this passage, and not only in this passage, not only the word if, but the phrase in vain. Even twice in verses 1 through 11, you're going to see in vain. that Life is in vain. Everything is in vain. Everything that you can imagine that's associated with your hope and with your faith, with our message, is going to be in vain if Jesus isn't raised from the dead and if you are not going to be raised from the dead. So this morning, let's just play a little bit of the alt history game along with Paul. Let's just let him work it out for us. And let's let him say what it's all about, okay? So first of all, three things I want you to see. If Christ, if Christ isn't raised from the dead, first of all, he's going to tell us this, that the message of the gospel is in vain. The message of the gospel is in vain if Jesus isn't raised from the dead. If we just have a dead Savior, then our message is in vain. How many of you guys enjoy sleeping in? All right. How many of you guys can still physically sleep in? How many of you have someone in your life or something in your life that keeps you from sleeping in? A person. All right. Babies don't know about time change ever, do they? All right. It's always funny whenever we have time change here uh, and when people show up for church is because kids don't care what time it is. Hey, it's time to wake up. They don't look at the clock. We told our kids one time that, hey, whenever you think that it's time to get up, you look at the clock. And we may not be able to tell everything about it, but that digital clock, if the first number says 8, then maybe. All right? If the first number says 9, then yes. But anything less than that, no. All right? Now, that understanding radically changed our lives. But, you know, you you teach kids to look at a clock. You can't teach your dog to look at a clock. You can't teach your cat when it decides that it needs to make biscuits on you, all right? All on you at 630 in the morning or that they think it's time for them to snuggle up to your head, all right? Your dog doesn't care. Your dog doesn't care that it's still dark outside if they need to go to the bathroom or if they only have the zoomies. That's just what they do. You know, but thinking about sleeping in, sleeping in is a gift, all right? A gift. And if you can do it, take advantage of it. 
you know, today would have been a great day to sleep in. Beautiful day. A lot of things going on, you know. You go to breakfast. Go to lunch. You go grab that Bojangles. Yeah, it's just a, a great day to do that. Maybe go hiking at the cliffs. Drive over to Raleigh. Do those things. Folks, listen to this. All of those things would be wonderful things to do, and they are wonderful things to do. But yet, you are here. You are here. Why is it that you are here? It's because you believe the message is valuable. Because you believe that the fellowship is meaningful. It's because you believe that the worship of our God is a priority in your life. Listen, all of those things are true, not because we worship a dead Savior, but because we worship a living Savior. Because Jesus is raised from the dead, then folks, we have a message that is worth proclaiming. And we have a worship, that we, we have a, a message that is worth remembering as well. Think about it. Some of you have been Christians for years. You know, do you need to be told the story again? Do you need to come to faith anew in Jesus? Do you need to give your life to Christ again? Do you need to get baptized again? Do you need to do all of those things again? No. Let me tell you something. As Christians, as people who have been saved by Christ, we do ourselves very well and we put ourselves in a position to remember what God has done for us. And not just the memory of things that God has done for us in the past, but to remind ourselves that he's working in our future right now and that you and I have a hope that it transcends this life because the message is meaningful. As Christians, we have this message and we hold on to it. Otherwise, let's just sleep in. Otherwise, let's just go to the mosque down the road that tells us to work harder. Or let's just go to the the Jehovah's Witnesses that tell us that because we're here on Sunday, we're lost anyway. All right? Let's just go and let's worship somewhere else or let's just forget it all. But folks, we believe because Jesus has been raised from the dead, because the gospel story is Jesus dead, buried, resurrected, seen, changing lives, folks, our message is valuable. It's meaningful, and it's worth giving your life to. Paul says, if Jesus isn't raised from the dead, our preaching's in vain. You know what? You guys could have slept in. We could have left you there in Corinth. We could have left you there in the temples of Aphrodite. We could have left you there eating on just gluttony, all the things that are going along, just in all the materialism that you were stuck in, all the immorality, all of the rivalry, all of the political upheaval, all of the stuff that goes on, we could have just left you there because life has no meaning. But yet our God carried us there and we proclaimed this gospel and you received it because it tells us that something new is coming. Something new is coming and that you can get in on this thing that is new and the change that the gospel brings in our lives. This Jesus that dead, buried, resurrected has meant to change your life and it's by buying into this message and buying into this hope that your life is worth living and that our gatherings are worth having and that our worship is worth offering and that our remembering our remembering is worth remembering. But not only that, It's worth proclaiming as well. Because there may be Christians here in this room, and I pray that there are. Let's just pray we are. I mean, right? Right? But at the same time, there may be people who aren't Christians. All right? Here's the deal. The message of the gospel is true whether you're remembering something that happened in the past to you and is ongoing in your life, or whether you're first encountering it, perhaps initially, right? Some of you today may be coming in here, and you're looking at this gospel message almost as like you're buying a car, all right? How many of us, you know, guys do particular things whenever we're packing. Let's just say whenever whenever you see guys loading a trailer, and they're going to be using toe straps, or not toe straps, or or, or ratchet straps. Anybody know what those things are? The things you click, and you click, 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 and they tighten everything up. I have never known a guy yet that uses ratchet straps, that doesn't tighten them down, that doesn't grab it at the end and say, oh, that's good. That's good. That's tight enough. 
That's tight enough because you don't want your mattress blowing out, all right? You don't want your furniture falling off. We're always going to say that's good. But how many guys do you also know when they're buying a car will go up or buying a used car especially and kick the tires? Anybody know anybody something that kicked the tires? Why do you kick the tires? The tires, I mean, they may be good, but, but certainly looking at them was probably better than kicking them. Right? Looking to see if they have tread is, whether, is better than probably just seeing if your foot bounces off of it in the right kind of way. All right? it, just, it just very much is. You know, and, then you, and you ladies will laugh about guys kicking the tires, but how many of you, when you walk by a swimming pool, do this before you ever jump in? All right? How many of you do that? Some of you, yeah, uh-huh, you do that. All right? Some of you know that, that the water is never going to be hot enough until July. All right, never going to be warm enough until July. But, you know, you're testing things out. And that may be why you're here this morning. You may be checking out what this is all about. Let me tell you something. The message of the gospel is this. And you may, for all of your, let's just say, preconceived notions, you may, for all of your understanding of what Christianity is based upon the media, pop culture, that it's just about this. You know what? Come here. Y'all worship everything. We make things right with God. We work harder. We try again next week when we come back and try to do it all over again. That's not the gospel, people. That's not the gospel. The gospel is this. Repent and believe. Repent and believe. Turn from yourself. Turn from your sin and come to Christ. Return to him. See him. Believe in him. Trust in him. Now, not that living a better life, not having morality. I mean, those, those are wonderful things. Or let's just say having, having a moral life and living upstanding lives. You know, you don't do that as a Christian to get God's love. You do that because you're trying to reflect the glory of the creator, but it comes after you believe the gospel. It comes after. We don't clean ourselves up and then come to Jesus. We don't kick the tires and just say, hey, that's good enough. You know, I think I'll give this thing a go. All right? We don't just do those kinds of things. And when we are told the gospel and we are encountered with the gospel or we encounter the gospel for the first time, folks, the command is this. Repent and believe. Well, believe what? Believe I can be better? Well, yeah, that's part of it. Believe I should live a kind of life that brings glory to God? Yes, it's a part of it. But it begins with this, that Jesus died, that Jesus was buried, that Jesus was resurrected, and Jesus was seen. And that message is that what we believe transforms our lives. Otherwise, our preaching is in vain. Otherwise, there's no need for you to remember. Otherwise, there's no need for you to come to Christ. But because Christ has been raised from the dead, all right, our message is worth believing. And your lives matter to God. Folks, that's the first thing. All right, alt history there. Paul goes even further. He says this. He says, and our preaching's in vain if Jesus isn't raised from the dead. But he also says this, your faith is in vain. Your faith is in vain. And what is faith? It's believing, of course. It's believing. It's having confidence and having trust. And you and I would say that our lives, when we talk about being saved, we're not saved by the things that we do. We just sang a song just a few moments ago called All Sufficient Merit, that when Jesus died upon the cross, that he provided everything we need to be able to come to God. I don't have to give anything to be able to make God love me. I don't have, there's nothing I can offer to make God love me more. I come in Jesus' name, and when I receive this salvation, I receive it by God's grace. It's a gift that's given to me, and I receive it by faith. Let me tell you, if Jesus isn't raised from the dead, there's no reason for you to believe anything. Paul says that. It's not, worth, it's not a message worth proclaiming. It's not a word, message worth believing in the past. You know, you're still in your sins, is what Paul would say. Still in your sins. And what does he mean by that? He tells us this. He says it's not about the fact that you're become, going to become sinless, and we say that a lot. Christians don't become sinless whenever we come to faith in Jesus. Well, hopefully we sin less, and sin has less of a power over us, but we're never going to become sinless. And this church there at Corinth certainly had its problems, right? Not only not believing in the resurrection, but you think about the other things that are going on. This place did not lend itself well to living a life that we would say honors God. You are still in your sins, though, Paul says. Still in your sins. 
He's not talking about the individual sins that may be happening. You may slipped up, you just might have messed up here, all right? What he's talking about this is being defined. Think about your life. If someone could describe you in just one word, what would that one word description be? Think about that. This this is a very interesting exercise to go through. Some of you may say, well, if one person could define me, I, I guess cheerful, you know? Maybe ambitious, driven, athletic, pretty, handsome. Those kinds of words just kind of come to mind. And here, here's the thing, you know, as me, as, as a pastor, whenever I, I, I do a lot of, let's just say, Christian school references. If you want to send your kids to, to Christian schools, a lot of times they will send your pastor or who you say is your pastor, a reference form. And you have to say, hey, you know, this, this family attends church. Are they committed? Are they all of this? There's all of these questions, but I always like the question that asks me, if you could describe this child in one word, okay, and talk about the child, what would you do or how would you do it? Folks, I'm going to tell you something. That that's one of the most fun exercises that you can do. Now, not we're all limited to one word, but at my heart, who am I? Or at your heart, who are you? Think about it, you know? But what about this? How does God look at us and define us? Well, in Christ, he defines us according to Christ. When our faith is in him, he sees us as righteous. When our faith is in him, our trust is in him, he sees us as perfect. Not because we are, but because Jesus is. What Paul means here is you're still in your sins, is that if God looks at you and Jesus has not been raised from the dead, you're still a sinner. You're still on the outside. You're still lost. You're still an alien and a stranger. You're hostile to God. You're not in any way a part of God's family. You're still in your sins. Your faith is in vain, and you are still in your sins if this has not happened to you in the past, and if Jesus has not been raised from the dead. Your faith is in vain. Faith is in vain. Folks, I want to tell you today, You're not here just to say, okay, Jesus saved me in the past and that one day my soul is going to go and live with him. No, Paul says that that faith that you experienced at some point in your life in the past as Corinthian Christians or Pikevillian Christians or whatever you define yourself as, you know, that's a real thing that happened. And the stamp of approval, okay, upon what really happened in the past is that there's something that's going to be coming in the future. And it's not just that God came to save your soul in the past. It's he came to save your body in the future, right? Because not only is our message in vain if Jesus isn't raised from the dead, not only is your faith in Christ, you're saying, I'm going to trust in him alone for my salvation. Not only is that in vain, but your hope is in vain. Your hope for the future is in vain if Jesus hasn't been raised from the dead. See, faith looks back. Hope looks forward. Hope looks forward. And the problem was is that so many of them in this particular era of the church, church history, Paul even makes references to this in the first 11 verses when he talks about Jesus being seen. Notice how he says, you know, a lot of these folks that saw Jesus are still alive, but some of them are dead, okay? Some of them are dead, but Jesus appeared to them, and everything is, is okay whether they are alive or dead. But people in Corinth were beginning to see, hey, you know what? It may not be immediate when Jesus comes back. You know, we've been waiting 2,000 years for Jesus to come back to this earth. In the first century, as people, the, as this first generation of Christians are living and dying, there was real concern. Real concern that, you know what, if I'm not alive when Jesus comes back, then I'm not going to be made new. I'm not going to be made new. Now, the problem for that is that you and I as Christians, you know, living a long time to ensure that we're here when Jesus comes back, so far it's been an impossible proposition, right? We've got lots of Christians who have died over the years. Does that mean that they've died, as Paul would say, in vain, that they have no hope, that they died hopeless because they have been put in the ground and they didn't stay alive? Too bad. Try again later on, all right, because you were not alive. Paul says no. It doesn't matter whether you were dead. 
when Jesus comes back, if you're in Jesus, you are going to live forever because your hope is well-founded in something that God is going to do. God is faithful to save. God is faithful to hold you for the future. He who has saved in the past will save you in the future. Hope, hope, life as it is right now. How many of you, don't answer this out loud or don't hold your hands up or anything, but say that life is pretty good right now? Based on circumstances, absolutely, absolutely. How many of you would probably just say in your hearts, yeah, life could be better? All right, some of you. Some of you say, life really is terrible right now. Some of you could probably say that just based upon the circumstances in which you find yourself. But can you imagine, can you imagine if the life that you're living right now was never going to get any better, right? That this is just going to be what it is, and this is how it's going to be forever. And this is just my physical existence is going to be. And then one day I'm going to die, and then it's all going to be over, and my life will have been meaningless. My life will have been hopeless. Folks, let me tell you something. We have in our country, you know, it's a rise in suicide rates, just continues to go up. You know when people commit suicide? When they have no hope. When they just see, I'm not important. I don't have really any value. I don't really have any meaning. We find ourselves in a position where we say, well, you know what, I'd just be better off if I wasn't even a part of the story, if I wasn't even here. Hopelessness will kill. Hopelessness kills your spirit. Hopelessness will kill you in such a way that eventually you see no reason to live. But because of the hope that we have in Jesus, we can say this. You know what? My life, if it's good right now, you know, that's just a foretaste of what is to come. Every experience that I have had of joy and of peace and of happiness, you know, that's just a little nipple of what's to come in the future. But if my life is really struggling right now, or if I'm anywhere in between, and yes, things could be a whole, a whole lot better, and sometimes we can say that I wish things were, were, were just, just absolutely 180 degrees from where they are right now. Let me tell you that this life isn't all that there is. And this life is going to, you're going to struggle in it. And Paul is going to say, you know, if this is all we have, we should be pitied above everybody else. I mean, we're absolutely miserable. If this is all we have, then might as well, as I said earlier, just sleep in. Just go home. Just give up. But because there is this hope that looks forward, that tells us, hey, you know what? It's a new creation coming, and you're a part of it. There's a new part of your reality that you haven't even seen yet. Paul would later on say, or earlier say, no eye has seen or ear heard anything that God has prepared for those that are, that are in him. That is coming for you as a part of the new creation that God is working and that God has begun in his son and that God has continued in you and will one day bring to completion. Folks, it's not just, hey, Come to Jesus. He'll take you to heaven when you die, and everything will be okay. No, that's wonderful in and of itself. But there's something that's much better that's part of the gospel that we believe. It's that Jesus dead, Jesus buried, Jesus resurrected, Jesus seen, Jesus coming again means that when our faith is in him, and our faith is in him, that we not only have a message to proclaim, we not only have a faith that sustains us by looking at what God has done in the past. But we have a hope that sees us into the next life. What if, what if, what if Jesus isn't raised from the dead? Paul says, well, our preaching's in vain. What if Jesus isn't raised from the dead? Your faith is dead, and you are still in your sins. What if Jesus isn't raised from the dead? Well, you have no hope for the future. We should just be pitted and miserable. No. Paul says, absolutely not. That's not the history. The history is this, is that because Jesus has been raised from the dead, our message is worth proclaiming and it's worth believing. Our message is worth your faith. Our message is worth the hope because Jesus is worth it all. 
me tell you today, as Christians, we glory in that message. It sustains us. It gives us life. It gives us hope. And we remember it. And we do best when we remember it often. And that is why we gather here in this place with gratitude in our hearts, remembering what God has done for us, reminding ourselves of the faith that has saved us and thinking about the hope that is to come. Folks, that's why we do what we do, all right? All of that stuff would not be true had Jesus not raised from the dead. But because he is, because he lives, what's the song? I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone because I know, oh, oh, he holds the future. And life is worth the living. Why? Because he lives. And because he lives, so shall I. Christian, glory in that truth. Remember that truth. If you have not come to terms with the Lord Jesus, maybe you're the kicking tires kind. Maybe you're the dip the foot in the pool kind of. And maybe you're just here saying, oh, okay, well, what if? What if? I tell you, our God's not into all history when it comes to the work of his son. Our God is in the completed act in history because of his son. What he has done for you and for me in Christ, folks, gives us that message, gives us that faith, gives us that hope. It's not about what if, it's because of. You and I can live in that reality today. Jesus is alive. Jesus saves. Jesus will give us hope. And we'll see all of our hopes realized in him. Folks, let's bow our heads together and let's pray. Father, we thank you for this morning and for the opportunity that we have as Christians to remind ourselves that our future is settled because of what Jesus has indeed done. That we don't have to play the what-if game. That we simply repent and believe. We trust and obey. We proclaim this message of hope. We proclaim a faith that saves in the past and that saves in the present and a hope that sees us into the next life. A real hope a sure hope, a steadfast hope that a new creation is coming and that we in Christ are a part of it all. Father, I pray that that would give us life even now, true and meaningful life. And Father, that it would sustain us in the dark days of this life, that what is to come doesn't even begin to compare, God, and the glory and the beauty for what is to come. It makes life worth living whatever the circumstances are right now. May we live with hope because of what Jesus has done. Father, today, we thank you for that hope that we have as Christians, and we ask that by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would introduce others into that hope as well. That, Father, that by your grace that you would extend saving faith to those who repent and believe that Jesus came to do what Jesus came to do that he died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised again on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he was seen, and that God, he will indeed come again. Father, we thank you, we love you, and we pray all of these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. All right, folks, we're going to let you guys go here in just a few minutes, but we do want to tell you that if you have any questions about anything you've seen or heard here at Gateway this morning, find somebody wearing a name tag. We'd love to introduce you to this Jesus, to our hope. We would love to be able to introduce you to his kingdom and to see you come to know him today. Also, we mentioned as well earlier the connection card as well as the Church Center app, depending on whether you want to do it on your pen and paper. You can do it there, um, or you can just uh, scan the QR code there on the screen. You can do that. Either way, just let us know that you are here this morning. Also, a few things that are coming up. We do want to tell you that next Sunday evening is our fellow fellowship meal that we're having here at Gateway, 5 p.m. that night. And looking forward to a great night. And what we're asking everybody to do is a couple of things. First of all, sign up at the guest services counter because we want to know who all is going to be here, how many people are going to be here, just to help us plan for all the things logistically. But we're also asking you, if you're planning to attend, to bring a meat and a side or dessert. All right, now let me, let me explain that, all right? So you get the bucket of chicken. All right, that's the meat, okay? And then you can go to the store and get some green beans, all right? 
That's a meat and a side. Or you can get the bucket of chicken, okay, and you can go to the store and buy the ingredients to make a banana pudding, okay? And you can do it that way, all right? Or if you're feeling really ambitious, you can go and get the bucket of chicken and get the green beans and make the banana pudding, all right? So that's the way that we want to make sure that everybody has, because we know that the Baptists love to eat, right? Any, any Baptists here? All right. Yeah. Baptists love to eat, and sometimes we have to explain what that means, all right, to, 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 to folks that, that may be coming from other uh, denominations. That's okay. That is okay, but we're going to have plenty of food that night, so just make sure that we have enough food. Uh, we just ask everybody to bring a meat and a side, a meat and a dessert, or a meat and a side and a dessert. Right? That's the way that it's going to work. So sign up at the guest services counter for that. Also, remember, men's camping trip is coming up. If you're interested in that, men, the first weekend in May, the Friday and Saturday, I think that's May the 3rd and 4th, you can sign up at the guest services counter for that. You don't have to spend the night. How many of you, how many of you would say that you used to spend the night outside? I fall squarely into that category, all right? I don't spend the night outside unless I absolutely have to, and I can't remember the last time I had to, all right? So, so if you want to come and, and just hang out for a while there at the Cliffs of the News, you're more than welcome to do that. We're going to have hot dogs. We're going to have uh, just a, a great time of fellowship. You can sign up at the guest services counter. It does cost $5 a guy just to make sure that we have enough food for everybody and to purchase the hot dogs. So 5 bucks helps us to not only pray uh, for the food but also for the campsite as well. So we ask everybody to do that, whether you're signing up online or whether you're signing up at the guest services counter. Just make sure that you bring that 5 bucks or get us that 5 bucks as a part of it, whether you're staying all night or whether you're just coming for a little while. Then finally, Mother's Day is coming up just a few weeks down the road. That's May. May the 12th. We're looking forward to a great Sunday morning as we honor all of our ladies. But as a part of Mother's Day, we always have um, baby dedication here. So if you have a child that needs to be dedicated, or you'd like to have de dedicated to the Lord on that morning at 930 at the beginning of, the, of our service, we're going to have baby dedication. We talk about baby dedication. It's basically for those that are about five years old and younger. When you start talking about older than five, you start talking about salvation. You start talking about explicit faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ, but when you start talking about baby dedication, you know, five and under is good for that, so we're looking forward to that, but we also need to know how many of you that want to participate in that, so you can sign up at the guest services counter. We just need a few things, just need your child's name, their age, also need your names. You can do that online as well on our online form through on Church Center app, so all of that is good. We're looking forward to those three things, fellowship meal, men's camping trip, baby dedication coming up. And as we get ready to close out our service today, we're going to read from the scriptures once more. So let's all stand together. Let's all read God's word from Psalm 115 this evening or this morning as our benediction, and then let us be dismissed. The scriptures read like this. May you be blessed by the Lord who made heaven and earth. May God bless you, and we'll see you next Sunday here at Gateway.